Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and, uh, and welcome. First of all, I think the only housekeeping um, uh, matter I have to tell you about is that we don't have any, we're not anticipating any trial fire alarms, um, so if there is one, it's, it's for real, <clears throat> and there is an exit at the back where you came in, and another one um, here, and if that rings, then we should leave, please. Right, so, good evening. Welcome to the latest in the series of Westminster Talks. My name's Jane Wright, and I'm head of the Department of Property and Construction um, over at Marylebone. I'm here in place of Harry Charrington, who is acting dean of the Faculty of um, Architecture and the Built Environment. Um, unfortunately, he is very poorly. He, he, he rang me this morning with his, I'm definitely feeling very poorly voice on, and said he was really sorry that he can't be here this evening. Our talk this evening is being given by James Waits, CBE. Chairman of Waits, Construction, and a Governor of the University. Not only that, um, he's also an alumnus, having, I understand, studied estate management here a year or two ago. One or two. <laughs> James joined Waits Construction in 1983 and was appointed Chairman in 2013. As well as leading one of the foremost family-owned companies in the sector, he has a splendid record of leadership in several under other industry bodies. For example, he's chair of the CITB. He's a trustee of the building research establishment. He was a, a long-time chair of the UK Contractors Group. Until last September, it merged with the National Specialist Contractors Council, to form Build UK, of which he is now a co-chair. Beyond this, he's also been involved, or is involved in various charitable programmes, including, again, just for example, uh, chair of the Prince's Trust Built Environment Leadership Group and vice chair of the Queen Elizabeth Foundation uh, for Disabled People. In January 2012, James was awarded the CBE for services to construction and the charitable sector. The Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment is particularly proud of the university's ongoing relationship with James and with Waits. And I'm sure that James's talk will reveal that we hold many common values, passions and beliefs in this sector. Professionalism is the key to all we do in the faculty. Most of our students are employed within one of the built environment professions, and one of the features of our courses is the number of guest speakers <coughs> and visiting lecturers who contribute to our programs. We're firm believers in increased cooperation across the sector, and an understanding that we need to work in a complementary, not competing way with each other. It's really important that we acknowledge that each of us has a particular and special contribution to make. To take James's theme of medicine, uh, perhaps we need to see ourselves like a team in an operating theatre, working together with the understanding the only really important outcome is the health of the patient. The health of the construction industry, really important. The challenge of nurturing professionalism in an ever pressured and monetized commercial environment will, I'm sure, make a fascinating talk. I'd like to end with thanking James and the Waits Family Enterprise Trust for their generous support for the faculty in offering us 10 new scholarships. These will be for students embarking on full-time undergraduate study from this year. The plan is that these scholarships will help support able students who may be the first in their families to attend university and who, but for this financial support, might not otherwise be able to contemplate a university education. Thank you, James, for your part in that. And now, over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and to others at the University of Westminster for inviting me to speak. And thank you to everyone for coming along. I hope what I'm going to say tonight stimulates some thoughts. 
I think everyone here appreciates personally how important buildings are. Everyone needs a home in which to live. You need a healthy and protective environment in which to work or study. And right this very minute, you need a roof over your head and a comfortable place to sit. My holding your attention might be somewhat difficult if we were holding this talk al fresco, particularly in light of the recent weather patterns. Let's take a few seconds and think about how important buildings are for you, your family, friends and colleagues. Buildings keep us all safe and healthy. They allow work to get done. They bring people together and allow society to function. They enable civilization and culture to exist and persist. They serve practical purposes, but also often delight and inspire us with their art and indeed majesty. So with such high importance, we have to wonder why so much poor building goes on. We often hear of so-called cowboy builders and homes that literally fail to keep people warm and dry. The world is full of bad buildings. Not far away from here, up on the Maribyrn Road, my company is renovating the old Maribyrn Town Hall, creating a new world-class educational facility for the London Business School. The Town Hall is a beautiful and historic structure, of particular note for being the site of many celebrity marriages. Some of you might know that that's Paul McCartney's favourite place. A lot of you probably don't know he's done it three times. A glutton for punishment, you might say. The main structure was built in the 1920s, and the annex was added in the 40s. Ironically, it is the newer annex that is in the worst shape. Poor construction meant that water seeped into the structure, and the steel beams have begun to rust. The damage is, of course, repairable, but at a cost. But it is a wonder how a building so symbolically important could have been constructed so poorly. Some of it was undoubtedly poor knowledge at the time, but some of it was undoubtedly poor execution. I personally am passionate about building. I've been in the construction business since I was a teenager. And even when I was studying here at the University of Westminster, or PCL as it was in my day, I couldn't wait to get back into the industry and work on site, and probably earn some money too, and that was for the beer. Building is in my blood. I get frustrated when things go wrong. I get frustrated when builders do shoddy work and people suffer as a result. When industry bodies fail to set and maintain strong quality standards. When we fail to attract bright and motivated young people to pursue careers in construction. When architects, engineers and builders don't work together efficiently for the sake of delivering an excellent product for the client. Of course, it's inevitable that things go wrong. Mistakes happen. I know firsthand. I remember as a young section manager putting a hole in the wrong place in a concrete slab. That's not an easy mistake to rectify, I can assure you. And I've never been allowed to forget it either. Fortunately, I learned from my mistakes. And fortunately, again, there is hope in the world, or there's hope for the world, for a shoddy building. And in a word, that hope is professionalism. Being so committed to the construction industry, I have aspirations that professionalism in the built environment can achieve the same standards as, for example, in the fields of medicine or the law. Lofty aspirations indeed, but are they warranted, you may ask? I believe they are. So this evening, I want to talk to you about the importance of building, the value of professionalism to building, and how professionalism can make all of our lives a little bit better. I've already mentioned how buildings are integral to our lives, our work, and our society. I should add that the construction industry is an economic engine room. 70% of the world's wealth is in land and buildings. And probably half of that value is just down the road in Mayfair. But I'm not, I'm not a surveyor, so don't quote me on that. I'm proud that nearly 10% of the UK's GDP is provided by the construction industry in its broadest context. From the designers and engineers, to the building contractors, to those who maintain and repair the facilities. It's a £125 billion a year 
industry. And let's not forget, construction leaves a tremendously long legacy. What we build today will affect people's lives long into the future. And what we produce today will affect how future generations view our society and our legacy. Think about it. Do we want today's buildings to be compared to the Victorian era's, era's sturdy homes and majestic museums? Or to the 1960s high-rise council flats and soulless concrete town centres? Building is important for so many reasons. You may be thinking back to the title of this speech and wondering, isn't it a stretch to compare the construction industry with the medical field? Perhaps in some ways it is, but I think it deserves a few thoughts. We have a fundamental human need for buildings. Shelter, as I'm sure you know, is pretty high up on Maslow's hierarchy of need. We need homes to live in, schools to educate our children in, infrastructure to provide safe drinking water and sanitation, travel, roads, etc. Town halls for registering births, deaths, and even rock star marriages. These, well at least most of them, are indeed fundamental human rights, and construction helps deliver them. And like medicine, the impact of construction on our society's health and safety is significant. First of all, there are the health and safety risks inherent in construction itself. Three million people in the UK are employed in construction. And especially for those who work on our site, it is our obligation to keep these people safe in the workplace. Then there are health and safety impacts on the users of those buildings and the infrastructure. This is massive. We've been aware of so-called sick building syndrome since the 1980s. Buildings plagued with poor ventilation, mold, toxic chemicals, etc., and they bear huge costs to workers, employers, government, and society. An estimated 30 billion pounds worth of GDP is lost to illness each year in the UK. And some of this can directly be attributed to the buildings we work in. On the more positive side, we've become more aware recently of how well-designed buildings can improve the well-being of people who use them. Studies have shown that hospital patients with views of nature heal more quickly. Office workers with a window seat sleep better at night. And doubling the supply of outdoor air to an office reduces short-term sick leave by 35%. So whenever a construction company like mine begins a project, we are acutely aware of the building's future impact on people who use it. Perhaps the sense of responsibility borne by a construction worker yielding a trowel is not as acute as that borne by a surgeon yielding a scalpel. But that's an extreme example. Some analogies exist between construction, some of the analogies that exist between construction and medicine do hold true. Success requires many specialists working in coordination. Teamwork is vital. Failure puts lives at stake and impacts many more. It's been said that diagnosis is Greek for best guess. While the classicists amongst you will know that's not the exact translation, it does illustrate a point. In construction, as in medicine, it's not always easy to figure out exactly what's wrong. We are indeed dealing with complex structures. In construction, we have to get it right first time. Look at Taiwan. Plain and simple, errors lead to misery. So, how do we avoid errors? Here again, we return to my favourite word, professionalism. Professional, professionalism is one of those principles that is difficult to find fault with. Of course, we all want more professionalism. There's no downside to it, especially if you agree with the popular saying, if you think hiring a professional is expensive, Try hiring an amateur. And so it is for the construction industry. We all want to be professionals and deliver quality work which represents good value for our clients. But scratch the surface and we find there is a lot more to professionalism than glib sayings. Just getting paid to do a job is not enough. My son could get paid for mowing someone's lawn. That doesn't make him a professional. Professionalism is about excellence, adding value, and importantly, earning a premium for it. In the medical field, there are numerous laws, standards, and institutions that help define 
what makes a professional. Doctors in the UK have to be registered with the General Medical Council and they have to adhere to its standards. Critically, there is a rich tradition of ethics in medicine tracing back to the Hippocratic, Hippocratic Oath. This ethical foundation is an integral part of professionalism. It is about integrity, being honest, delivering on promises. Professionalism in any field is also about quality, learning the skills and doing your job well. To retain quality, you need commitment, obtaining all the necessary qualifications and staying on top of the latest developments. Hence the need for continuous professional development. And at its heart, it is about being deserving of trust. If you, if you have ethics, quality and commitment, the trust will follow. There is a long and rich tradition of professional institutions in the UK. We have numerous chartered institutes. We have the city livery companies and other guilds. We have an extensive array of organisations offering vocational qualifications and outstanding universities. All these institutions established, establish and promote professionalism in the form of high standards of quality and ethics. Furthermore, they promote a broad view of one's responsibilities, recognising that an individual's actions can affect all of society. To be a professional is to act not just in your own interests, not just in the interests of your client, but also in the, in the interests of the broader public. This is in particular something that the professional institutions contribute. A consideration of the public interest and involvement in development of public policy to that end. Lobbying is one other way to describe it. Another way is enlightening the legislative process with one's expertise, which I think sounds more erudite. But however you describe it, it has always been important for professional institutions to engage with those who are making the laws. It's even broader than that. The professional institutions also promote a commitment to be involved in society generally, and specifically in the schools. In the built environment, there are more professional institutions than I could possibly mention without keeping you here till the wee small hours. But to name just a few, there's a Chartered Institute of Building, my own institution, the Royal Institute of British Architects, and the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. They are authoritative, internationally respected organisations. The problem is, I just mentioned three of them, and I could have mentioned many, many more. For example, the Chartered Institute of Building Service Engineers, fantastic. The Institution of Structural Engineers, vitally important. And the Landscape Institute, all part of the built environment. Plus, there are other specialist organisations that are relevant to construction, such as the Chartered Institute of Plumbing and Heating Engineers, and the Institution of Engineering and Technology a huge plethora of institutions. But the large number of institutes belies an imbalanced situation. Unfortunately, there is an unwritten assumption in the built environment that professionalism is only for the architects and the engineers and the surveyors. Both architecture and engineering have their own highly regarded, internationally respected institutes. And I don't want to take anything away from that. But the best design buildings can't become reality without the builders. And the best designers are all for naught if the construction is poor or if the building is not properly maintained. So they shouldn't be the sole purveyors of professionalism. Quality has to run all the way through the value chain. So we have to raise standards in the post-design stages so that there is a parity of stature and professionalism amongst all the practitioners in the built environment. Professionalism is not just for the architects. To complicate matters, we have a huge skills gap in the UK construction industry. This is, to put it mildly, inconvenient. The government has announced that it wants, wants 400,000 new affordable homes to be built by 2020. And infrastructure projects such as the High Speed 2 and Crossrail 2 rail lines. They are central to the government's plans to build stronger foundations to the, for the economy. We are the builders, they say. Frankly, they might have to be, because simply put, we do not have enough skilled workers to accomplish those goals. The Construction Skills Network estimates that each year, the next five years and beyond, 
there will be a demand for 4,300 skilled people in the wood trades and interior fit outs sector. 2,800 bricklayers a year. 2,200 painters and decorators. 2,000 electricians. Plus an outstanding 9,400 technical, IT, and other office based staff. So, where will all these workers come from? Why have we not been able to match the supply of labor with the demand of employers? I believe one of these problems is that there is an esteem gap for many vocational education routes. Recent research has indeed confirmed this. Most people agree that vocational training is essential for the economic health of the nation. But when it comes to career paths for their own children or pupils, parents and teachers still recommend a university education. I hasten to clarify, there's nothing wrong with university. I am, after all, as Jane said, a governor of this fine institution. But university is not the only route to a rewarding professional career. And the educational system in this country is infused with the assumption that success means university. I am concerned that the UK educational system currently lacks a clear connection to the country's economic needs. While I agree that education has its own inherent value, if the taxpayers and government are investing in young people's education, they deserve some form of economic return. And global competition is fierce. If our country does not equip the next generation with skills relevant to competing in the global economy, we will lose out to other nations whose investment is indeed more focused. We will become even more dependent on foreign labour and our exporting power will diminish. What's the answer to this economic quandary? Of course, it's not easy. But once again, a key part of the solution is my favourite word, professionalism. I believe that if we improve the professionalism within the construction sector, we can attract talented, motivated people in the UK. If they get a decent foundation of skills in school, we can show them the route to a profession and help them bridge the divide between school and the world of work. There are other divides that professionalism can also help bridge. I mentioned a minute ago the unwritten assumption that the designers and consultants are more worthy of professionalism than the builders. To make things worse, the divide in professionalism is accompanied by a divide in working practice. Each speciality tends to work in its own silo. Many of the built environment disciplines work independently. Architects produce designs that please clients and please the planners and please the environment. But they do not consult with the builders, who almost certainly will not have been appointed at that stage. Standards and working methods are not coordinated through all stages in the construction process. It hasn't always been like this. Up until the Industrial Revolution, master builders oversaw the whole process. The design, the costing, the building, and employment of specialists as needed. The master builders were highly respected professionals who did everything literally under one roof. Christopher Wren was a master builder. He not only designed St Paul's Cathedral, but he oversaw the actual construction. Throughout the building process, he was given the freedom to make the changes he saw fit to the design and engineering. But in the 1800s, the fields of architecture and engineering became more specialised. And then, particularly after the First World War, the industry began to fragment. Building technologies became more sophisticated, if not, as we saw in the Maribyrn Town Hall, well executed. So specialists developed their own professional communities and the commercial identities that went alongside them, a divide that does persist to this day. There have been efforts over the past two decades to consolidate the management of construction, but we are still left with a division into two ma main parts, the virtual, the designers and consultants, and what I would call the real, the contractors, the sub subcontractors and specialists, who actually build the building. Mind you, there is hope. There is increasing use in the industry of building informational modeling, modeling, or BIM, which is the 3D mapping of the building and site on a digital platform. 
BIM means that architects, engineers, and builders all have access to the same data and drawings. It makes collaboration easier. But take up of BIM is slow. And for the most part, the system is dominated by a fragmented, disjointed approach that causes inefficiencies and tensions between designers and builders. And in the end, does not serve the client's best interests. I am convinced that professionalism can bridge these divides. The divides between architects, engineers, builders, and those who maintain the buildings. And the divides between the educational system and the employers. In fact, there has been some valuable research published re recently on professionalism in the built environment. Last year, backed by a group called the Edge Commission, the former government chief construction advisor, Paul Morell, published a booklet outlining a vision for my machine to crash on me. <laughs> I knew that would happen. So I shall revert to paper. The good thing is I always have backup, which hopefully I can find. It's done to me once before, you know. Okay. So Paul, Paul's view was that the valuable research backed by um, the Edge Commission outlining a, a vision for greater professionalism in the built environment. The booklet provided extremely valuable recommendations and here are just a few. To develop a single standard code of conduct to be used across the built environment, like the Hippocratic Oath is, in, is for medicine. To commit to a review of the silo nature of the education system as it relates to the built environment, with the ultimate goal of encouraging greater integration of specialisms in the academic and vocational worlds. To create a new interdisciplinary uh, designation of chartered construction and property professional and to establish a joint think tank to pool resources of the, of the institutions, a kind of king's fund for the built environment. Note the intriguing references to the medical profession, to which I will return in a minute. But I want to emphasize also that professionalism is not just for the institutions. It is not just about qualifications and abstract standards. It is about performance and delivery on the ground. Not just what we learn in the lecture hall, but, we, but what we execute on the construction site. We have some phenomenally bright people in this industry and in this country. And our ability to deliver massive projects such as Crossrail and the Olympics is proven. This country has world-class experts in design, digital modeling, smart cities, infrastructure development, nuclear energy, and the list goes on. And the key to a productive sector is to embed the bright thinking at all stages in the delivery chain. Every stage needs to be smart and professional. In short, for the industry to become more professional, it is for the industry to behave more professionally. This means everybody in the built environment world upholding high standards of quality and ethical behavior. The big construction companies in particular, of which my own company is one, need to do a better job of delivering value for the customer. We've got to be client-centric, and we've got to see the end product as a whole. There's a great parable of the five blind men and an elephant. One feels the trunk and thinks it's a hosepipe. The second feels the tail and thinks it's a rope. The third feels a leg and thinks it's a tree. The fourth feels the body and thinks it's a wall. The fifth feels a tusk and thinks it's a spear. They're all right, of course, but unless they talk to each other, they'll get the diagnosis completely wrong. So it is in the construction industry. Architects, engineers, builders, and maintainers all need to communicate, collaborate, and care about the client. How to help this along? The Chartered Institute of Building as an institution that has a fairly broad remit to begin with, should expand and become more relevant to more people in the built environment profession. The industry body, Build UK, 
which is representative of large contractors and smaller specialists alike, needs to become a magnet for many other trade associations, helping to unify the voice of the industry and establish a better image of construction so that we can attract a more diverse workforce and win the war for talent. We should work towards a world in which everyone in the built environment field has a professional qualification. Yes, bricklayers and plasterers as much as architects and engineers. There's a huge amount of personal responsibility here. All professionals in the built environment need to acknowledge their responsibility to engage with public policy and current issues of concern to the whole population, such as climate change, housing, education, and healthcare. And so we return to healthcare in my title. As I said earlier, there is a lot we can learn from the medical profession, and it gives us standards to aspire to. In the architectural world, many companies refer to themselves as a practice. Now that's a promising start. Featuring a community of professionals with complementary specialisms and skills working together. One can also imagine a practice of built environment professionals working across the whole value chain. Designers, builders, and facility managers. Sharing knowledge, learning from each other, aligning their visions, and working in close coordination to give the clients what they need. Delivering value, engaging with the government and other authorities, and the general public. Setting standards above and beyond what is required by law. Let me conclude by returning to the question, what did the Greeks ever do for us? I mentioned earlier the benefits of delivering a common code of ethics for the built environment. Something akin to the Hippocratic Oath. Well, I've learned there is no longer a single Hippocratic Oath used by everyone. But the contemporary version of the Hippocratic Oath in the UK is the General Medical Council's duties of a doctor. And in those duties, doctors are instructed. One, to keep your professional knowledge and skills up to date. Two, to recognize and work within the limits of your competence. Three, to protect and promote the health of patients and the public. Four, to work with colleagues in the ways that best serve patients' interests. And five, to be honest and open and act with integrity. Doctors are reminded they are personally accountable for their professional practice and must always be prepared to justify their decisions and actions. I think that's some pretty good advice for us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, we have time for just a few questions uh, before going and having uh, some refreshment. Do you not think that professionalism, rather than just being a, something that can add value to your own business, gives you something above, say, responsibility to the client? So if you're a professional, you don't just do what the client wants you to do. Mm. You've also got a responsibility, say, to society, not just to the, the end user or to the user. I think very much. I, mean, I think, and, and I, I hope that did come through a little bit, saying that you know, professionalism is more than just doing the job. It's actually a much wider um, agenda. And I think you know, professionalism is about raising the standards. It is being the best you can be. And sometimes it will be doing actually beyond what your clients want. It might be doing something different to what your clients want. But you also need to, to close that circle with delivering the economic value to the client. So there's always a, a, a conundrum there. But I, I think if you take the, the doctor analogy, um, you would expect your doctor to act with the greatest professionalism that he can. Um, you wouldn't tell him how to operate on your leg. But I think a, from a, you know, a designer's point of view, you need to be able to challenge your client for what is the best thing, and not necessarily say what the building is. In the sake of the idea of a doctor, as someone that's treating a patient, but say if we had RAWs and eugenics, for example, so, uh, and you could maybe genetically enhance your children, then other people may think that was illegal because it would make the, ne the next 1% of the world even more powerful than they've ever been. Mm. And that's the kind of responsibilities in genetics 
that in the construction industry could happen with your clients because they want you to push boundaries or cheat and stuff, um, which maybe would be wrong or incorrect. Yeah, and that's, I think, where the professional integrity comes into it um, and maintaining professional standards. And, you know, I, I mentioned the uh, terrible um, earthquake damage building in Taiwan. You, know, you could see how that was constructed. Um, so the constructor was unprofessional, and I would say the professionals who were overseeing it were unprofessional. Um, and that, was, that could well have been driven by a client wanting to keep costs down. So you know, it, it is, there's a, a very symbiotic relationship between professionalism and, and the need to deliver economic value. And maybe that's the problem with the 60s. The what, sorry? Maybe that was the problem with the 60s. Possibly. Possibly. Thank you. Uh, moving on, could you just um, introduce yourself very briefly as you say your question at, at the back there? Uh, yes, David Batchelor, fellow governor. This is not a rogue question, I hope. <laughs> on the subject of basic cost effectiveness, were the, the Victorian engineers better professionals or were they just allowed to over-specify everything? <laughs> oh, oh, and he said it wasn't a rogue question. Uh, it's not a rogue question at all. Um, I, I think that that was partly, David, because they, they were pushing the envelopes in terms of new structures and new ways of doing things. So it was... Were they over-specifying? Probably, because they certainly didn't want it to fall down. Um, but I think there was something about, around the, the psyche of the Victorians. They were, they were building longevity. Um, so I think they were looking to build beyond you know, the, the 60 years of a, a normal generation build. They were actually looking for things that were going to be there for a long time. So that was a driver. Did that, did that dodge the question effectively? Well, they, they achieved it. I mean, they it did. Fantastic. Yeah. So fantastic. fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. And mainly private finance as well. Um, M Michael Moore, Milton Keynes uh, Council. I'm a planner. Also, I'm a, also a University of Westminster a graduate. But I'd like to ask, how can we encourage more people, particularly young people, into the built environment profession? Good question, and something that myself and many others wrestle with on a daily basis. Um, there is a, and I'm, I'm going to use the, the, the paradigm completely wrongly, there is a view in the educational system that the construction sector, call it the built environment sector, that's for the dumbbells at the back of the class. That's, the ones, that's not for the bright ones. We've got to change that perception. To do that, we've got to engage with young people in schools early on, to actually open up the excitement of the built environment. And it is hugely exciting, and it needs passionate people to be out there. You know, I, 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 I've said that we need to educate the educators, persuade the, the parents, and convince the careers advisors that this is a great sector in which to work and very fulfilling. And I think there's, there's also a, a misconception that construction means you're going to be laying bricks the rest of your life. Absolutely not. You know, there are so many points of entry into construction. I referred to you know, the, the non-construction specific um, IT and HR and all that sort of stuff, all part of just what makes a great sector. Um, I'd just love to spend more time in school trying to persuade them. Oh, sorry, one minute, yes. Karen Tate. Um, the construction industry is very much a free entry industry, um, self-employed, SMEs, do you feel that there, that's actually a problem in terms of introducing or developing professionalism? Um, you literally, man on con the street can set up as a builder, yeah. um, enter and leave the, the, the industry as he wants. Um, how do you deal with that in terms of trying to, trying to set a professional standard? Yeah, I, I, that's a very good question. And I think one that is, it's, it's a real issue because, I mean, I, I think, there is too much focus on apprenticeship starts, as an example, not enough on completions. So you get people who've done a year or two years apprenticeship, and then they go up and sell on the road, and they, they call themselves a builder. So it's unregulated. Um, you compare that with other places in the world, so the US, Canada, where you actually have to be a certified, licensed contractor to do the work. I'm not one for bureaucracy. I'm not one for um, red tape and all that sort of thing. But I do think we need to maintain standards. We've got to get away in this country from every programme about building on the television about the cowboy builders. It's not about the really good stuff we do. Um, we've got to change our perception. Stephen. 
thanks. I'm Stephen Grunenberg from the University of Westminster. Um, yeah, uh, I actually couldn't agree more with what you're saying about professionalism uh, in construction and advocate to it myself. Um, but do you think that it, it will get anywhere without legislation? Do we not need continuity of employment? We've got a, a hire and fire ethos in the industry. That's not going to lead to professional attitudes in, in the skilled workforce and so on. So do we need legislation to get that done? And do you get a lot of agreement for what you're saying amongst your peers? Okay, I'll answer the, I'll answer the, the second part of the question first, if I may. Pretty much yes. Um, you know, I think people, you know, amongst my peers, we want to get the best people we can into our sector. Um, and I think we need to really drive professionalism at all levels to achieve that. Um, but I, I do think, I mean, legislation to me is a blunt instrument. Um, now, it may be a way of achieving a goal, but I'm, I have a, a discomfort with it. I mean, it, we need we need to be aspirational. We, we want to be a sector that people aspire to coming into. Um, and I think that in itself is, if you get that and you change the ethos and the understanding and, and, and the drive of it, I think you've got an opportunity to do it. I'm inherently uncomfortable with saying we've got to legislate and regulate, because that, that to me is adding cost and burden to what we're trying to do and actually can be a, um, a disincentive to people getting involved. But it's a challenge. Um, I mean, the, the best way of avoiding the hire and fire is to have steady growth economically. The problem is, you know, the, the construction sector is, it has such um, an economic, economic impact on the, the prosperity of great UK PLC that it's, it is very volatile. Um, I, mean, you, I mean, I was talking to someone earlier, you know, the fact that the stamp duty in increases that came in the last budget, the impact that has had on the housing market in London and is having is massive. That is going to actually lead to people redeploying elsewhere. So we're trying to build all these homes that people will not be working in London, they'll be going elsewhere. So I think we've, we've got big issues. If we can have a, a steady economic cycle, that, that'd be a dream. Every politi politician would love that as well, I think. But then you've, you can actually plan ahead. Because the planning of resources is the big challenge. And in our sector, the majority of training, certainly vocational type training, is done by the smaller and medium-sized companies. Um, so the trades training. And we would do, as you know, a main contractor, more technical and management type training. So the guys who are out there fighting tooth and nail for their bread and butter, they're getting up at the crack of dawn, they're putting their guys to work, they're then going back to their office and chasing payments or the ordering materials. They've then got to deal with health and safety. They've then got to deal with this and that. And ultimately, they're, they're thinking, I've got to get grant money from the CITB to do some training for an apprentice. It's so loud at, down, down the list of priorities. And alongside that, thinking, well, if I take an apprentice on, then I've got a commitment for three years. Will I have work for him in three years? Because those guys are committed to training apprentices, and they don't want to give them a false dawn. So it's, it's, it's a real, real conundrum. Um, and actually, it's something that um, Jane didn't mention. I've recently joined the Apprentice, Apprenticeship Delivery Board. So part of selling into business this need for three million apprentice starts, which I don't necessarily agree with. I prefer completions, but you've got to start somewhere. Um, and I think it, it's just getting the understanding across business generally that you know, an apprenticeship is a good routine, not the only routine, but a good routine. Um, and then just getting people to focus on making that commitment and then getting the work and giving the, the opportunity for people to continue and work. I think two more and then we'll have to uh, call it a day. Hi, this is Simon Foxall from The Architects Practice and The Edge. Thank you for quoting from our report. Um, do you feel that the professional institutions are fit for purpose um, for increasing the level of professionalism in the industry? And what urgent tasks do they need to get underway in order to fulfill your vision? I think that's a very good leading question. Um, I, th I think there are... 
I think the institutions are not necessarily as quick to move as they should be. Um, the, the, the structures they operate within and so on, I think, make for the pace of change to be quite slow. And I think the institutions have got to become much more dynamic in how they, they address the need for change and evolution. Um, and I, I would say that as a generalism, um, not specifically. I mean, there are some that are very cutting edge and others that are you know, still in a Victorian mentality. Um, urgent things to do, I, I think, is somehow unleashing the talent. You know, as, as I said when I was speaking, we've got very, very bright people in this country. We've got to give them opportunities. And sometimes that doesn't fit with the way an institutional think. I mean, we talk about institutional thinking. Sometimes you just need to you know, cut the leash and let some of these young, bright people change things. And, and I think finally. Just a quick one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, James, Linda from the Development Office at the University. Um, we've met before. <laughs> Thank yep. you. Um, I just had a quick question about um, increasing diversity in the construction industry, yeah. which I've, and particularly about more women, bringing mm -hmm. more women in, and where you feel that sits alongside, or can it sit alongside the agenda? Is it as important as the professionalization of the industry? Absolutely. Um, diversity in the industry is my bete noire. Um, and that is diversity in the broadest context. Um, and let's just focus on the gender diversification. If we don't attract women into the industry, we are denying ourselves 50% of our potential talent, talent pool. And we've got to do it. And we've got to be smarter in the way we actually set about our building projects so that women can actually do more of the stuff that is done on site. You know, just to say women can only do painting and decorating, well, that's madness. There's an awful lot they can do on sites. And we've got, to, we've got to be more thoughtful about how we design and procure so actually we can attract a greater um, breadth of talent. And I'm, I'm absolutely committed. Um, at Waits, um, where we are quite good, um, the CITB, where we're trying to drive it from the industry's point of view, to actually get much greater diversity. Because if you're not diverse, you are missing out on massive amounts of talent that we desperately need. Absolutely. Yeah. May I just ask, finally, very grand aspirations, which I don't think any of us could really disagree with, but what can we do? What are the baby steps that, um, that, that we mm. can do to help move things along? I suppose that the, the, the baby steps are, is, it is just that, it is the baby steps. It, it's, not, it's not trying to solve world hunger, but it's just saying, you know, just promoting the message constantly about professionalism. We're making professionalism not easy to attain, but actually enjoyable to retain. Because I think a lot of people, and I mentioned CPD when I was doing professional development, a lot of people find that tough. Um, and somehow we've got to, and this is going back to the institution's question, actually, how do we get people to continue the professional development? We've got to make it fun and interesting, not a drudge. James, fascinating, fascinating hour. Thank you so much for a really interesting talk, stimulated lots of ideas and questions. Thank you. Pleasure, thank you.